Welcome. I'm Cindy Davidson, the Education Trustee for Sila Foundation. Today, we are delighted to be hearing from Greg Kirsch on a topic near and dear to all licensing professionals, criminal history background screening best practices. Greg is Chief Operating and Compliance Officer at No More Forms, powered by Applicant Insight. He's an industry recognized expert in background screening and compliance for employment contractors and volunteers. He manages large compliance driven programs and regularly consults with some of the largest carriers in the country to develop screening solutions that are cost effective, compliant and address corporate goals and regulatory requirements. Greg is also currently chair of the SILA Agency Carrier Background Investigations Task Group and has been a longtime member and supporter of SILA. In fact, No More Forms was the sponsor for our June webinar. So we thank you, Greg, and your company for your generous contributions to our associations. Greg's gonna walk us through the various county, state, and federal databases used in criminal background investigations, and will help us understand the pros and cons of each commonly used search method, as well as best practices for protecting our institutions, our customers, and our reputations. We have one hour. We ask that you remain on mute. We'll be taking your questions and comments through the chat and I'll keep an eye on those as they come in. Please let us know if you're having any technical issues. We just switched back to Zoom from Big Marker, so that could happen and we'll try to help you out. And with that, I'll turn the program over to Greg. Thank you so much. So uh, some of you may have heard me cover some aspects of these topics in the past, but this is a full presentation that uh, we wanna do uh, built to identify the different uh, sources where criminal history can be found, break down the individual pros and cons of each sort of those sources, and then ultimately drive that into what a, a um, what I would call a best in. Uh, <laughs> can, can everyone still hear me? I'm gonna keep going, assuming everyone can still hear me. Uh, what, uh, break all those uh, searches down into what I would consider to be a, uh, a best practices uh, criminal history screening program. So um, this, the slide that I'm sharing right now is, it, it's a bit of a teaser slide now because we're gonna revisit this after breaking down some of the individual sources, but you can see uh, on the left-hand side, you see the different primary uh, criminal history, uh, uh, whether it be a repository or a place where a record can be found. And then I'm, I'm gonna break them down on, as far as their accuracy and compliance levels some of the search criteria that are used to identify or pull uh, the information and also the sources that they're available to. But first off, let's just talk about the five primary sources that I'm addressing here. And before I even do that, I wanna drive home the fact that there is no single one-stop shop for all criminal history. There's not some magical database that's gonna tell you everything that ever happened on a person. Um, the, every single one of these sources is, uh, is designed to do things a little bit differently. And it's really about piecing them together in order to come up with a, a comprehensive screening program. So let's start with the first one, and that is the county and or municipal court system. Uh, this is where the vast majority of criminal records are, are housed. They are actually tried in these locations. Um, for most offenses that uh, someone might be charged for, if it actually reaches the, the level to, to go to court, this is where a disposition will be rendered. There are over 3,000 of these across the country. I think Texas alone has about 250 of them. Uh, it is, in, in my opinion, and, and widely believed to be the best uh, possible source for accurate and up-to-date information on a single incident, so a single case number, you're going to get a fairly comprehensive history of the, the date the offense occurred, the date the court docket was filed, the due process that was afforded that, that individual, the, the charges and their history and the, the disposition. Um, there's multiple levels within these county court systems uh, and they also go by different names in some states. So uh, there may be, it may be upper and lower court, a superior circuit court. Um, in uh, Pennsylvania, there's common pleas and magisterial. Just know that within any individual county or, or if you're dealing with Louisiana Parish, there's a, a central or a county seat type of courthouse and then there's several smaller courts, even within that county, that will usually uh, try the uh, some of the lower level offenses. Uh, 
traffic infractions, things of that nature. And if it's severe enough on the misdemeanor level or felony level, it will typically push to that next level court. Um, the, the, this is, you might also hear a term from a background screening provider when they discuss the using the, the predominantly used index of that courthouse. They're typically talking about the county seat, the county court system of that, that individual jurisdiction. Um, there are a whole bunch of other subset courts, but uh, for the purposes of this, uh, this presentation, we're going to be talking about the criminal court system in the county courts. We're not going to be diving too much into family and civil and some of the traffic stuff. Um, the information in these courthouses is also uh, constitutionally uh, publicly available because it is the only way to uh, reasonably determine that an individual was afforded the, the proper due process, um, not just the burdens of proof to you know, uh, you know, be searched or, or be arrested, but ultimately whether they, uh, the, the right to speedy trial and all the other aspects of this are, um, are the reason why county court records are publicly available and for all intents and purposes always will be. Um, so uh, there are, again, some low level misdemeanors that you may not find in this index, but generally speaking, this is where the majority of the information you're, that, uh, or a majority of criminal history that takes place with an individual be housed. It would be the state of um, Florida versus John Doe, the state of uh, Pennsylvania versus Jane Doe, things along those lines. So real quick snapshot on the county court, county municipal court system. On the pros, it is a direct source. That's where it happened. The arrests and all the stuff that led to it, there's information indicating that, but this is really the source of how did that case end up. Um, there's a detailed history for each offense that exists within that area. Uh, you get charge history and sentencing. It is publicly accessible. It is, uh, the information is typically the most reliable up to date. For instance, if someone has a deferred adjudication and then petitions the court after two years probation to have it dismissed, the court record will typically reflect that dismissal even after the disposition took place. And um, there's also additional resources in these court systems that can help either search archives or provide clarity or pull uh, you know, much, much more expansive documents related to a specific case. And that comes in the form of clerk-based searches. Um, the, the cons on this is a lot of these are uh, name-based initial searches. There's multiple identifiers that can be found within the cases, but um, you're not dealing, it's not a you know, single, single fingerprint or um, it's rarely, if ever, an SSN-based uh, search criteria. Um, an, another con to keep in mind is some of the oldest cases in these courts uh, may not be readily available. Uh, they may be on microfiche and just completely uh, not part of what would be the, the, the searchable public index, or maybe part of it, just the header of that court case would be in the public index search, but it may take a little while to pull the archives on that case. Um, and uh, not all county court systems are the same. So in some areas, you have to rely specifically on the clerk to, to perform those searches. Um, and in other ones, it, it has a, a, you know, a, an easily accessible index that any person, uh, you don't have to be a PI or anything like that, you can just walk in and search the index uh, for a specific name and date combination or a case number or any number of other factors. And I would say, um, uh, another major thing just to keep in mind on these is information that exists in one county uh, will not be revealed in a search of even a neighboring county in the vast majority of cases. So unless the case was specifically transferred and there was some indicator, um, you could search a, a, you know, a, a county. There's many cities that contain uh, that cross boundaries with two or three different counties. A search in one county will not reveal an event that uh, was tried in another county. They're completely uh, for all intents and purposes, separate systems. So I want to jump to the second of the, the five sources here. This is the federal district court system. Again, this is another court system. The county court and the federal court are the only two that I'm going to cite as official source information because they are courts. They actually try the case. Um, with, without the involvement of the, the courts, the case does not exist. It won't get reported to the subsequent repositories and things that we'll talk about after this, but the federal district court system is completely separate from the county court system. Cases that exist in federal district court do not exist in county court and vice versa. These are cases where it is the United States versus John Doe, not the state of Florida versus John Doe. 
Um, anybody that's seen uh, uh, police shows will see where where the FBI and the uh, Georgia Bureau of Investigation and the local police force are all arguing over jurisdiction based off of a certain case and the, the feds take over and they say that we have jurisdiction to this case. That means it's going to be a federal case. Um, it means that the crimes that were committed uh, are part of the federal crimes code. It means that the uh, offenses may, uh, or the victim population may cross boundaries where there is no clear jurisdiction. So um, as a general rule, the federal court system has a, a relatively low hit rate, but when there is a hit, it's usually a pretty big deal. So, um, I, you know, I've been doing consumer reporting for 15 years now. Um, and, you know, only a couple of times have I come across um, misdemeanor type things or something like that in the federal court system. And that's usually because of a, a DUI that took place on a military base. So it took place on federal property, but it's not necessarily a felony. Generally, you're looking at um, exclusively felonies and pretty severe offenses. So again, low hit rate, but when it hits, it definitely, um, it definitely matters. Uh, a good example of the, the uh, federal court system, we're going for a federal court case going back, I, it's probably got to be 10, 10 or 12 years now, maybe even more, was um, the Michael Vick situation and um, his charges. Uh, that All those events took place in Virginia, but the FBI performed the investigation, charged him with a whole uh, set of offenses, convicted him at the federal level. That's where those cases are found. And then while he was in prison for that, the state of Virginia had other offenses that um, qualified under their state crimes code, and they tried him for different offenses, generally stemming from the same time period, but under state law. So he actually had cases at the federal level and cases at the state level, um, state of Virginia versus and then uh, United States versus. So if that helps put it into perspective, um, you know, usually famous or, or high profile cases end up in, in the federal court system. So pros and cons of the federal court system, just like county courts, it is a direct source a very detailed history for each offense. It's publicly accessible. Um, uh, I, and one area where this is uh, a little bit better than the, the county court system is that um, states have fewer federal districts. I, I think it ranges from one to, to three or one to four. For instance, the state of New Jersey, it's a sizable state. They only have one federal court. So um, you know, the areas where you're going to want to search and identify with a candidate's history to uh, determine if you should or sh shouldn't search a specific court jurisdiction, um, there's, a, a, there's a broader geographic coverage within any individual federal district. Uh, the information, just like county courts, reliable and, and current, and there are uh, staff in uh, you know, a pro you know, prosecuting prosecutor's offices and other um, parties that are available to uh, help for additional information. A major con of the, the federal court cases is DOB is not readily available on these. So all initial searches are name-based searches and then require quite a bit of digging to look for additional identifiers within the case. Sometimes it's a partial SSN, a DOB and age, um, uh, middle names and other identifiers can be found in there. It just takes a little bit longer to get a, a confirmed, uh, uh, confirmed result on there. And finally, just like the county court systems, a search of District A will not reveal a, 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 a case that was tried in uh, District B, or more, more specifically, an Eastern District versus a Western District. Um, now, some of the search systems do allow you to search multiple uh, districts at the same time, but just as a general rule, if you're uh, doing a targeted search, some, an event that exists in one district will not be found if you're exclusively searching the other district. So. Those are what I would call the two direct sources where criminal history is actually created. It's uh, for all intents and purposes manufactured. Um, let's jump to the third option here, which is state repositories. State repositories are in fact just that, they are a repository, they house information. Think of them as a large uh, digital warehouse. Information is fed into these repositories from the county court systems, oftentimes from other agencies within their jurisdiction. So. Um, the Pennsylvania State Police maintains the, uh, the, the Pennsylvania State Police uh, access to criminal history repository patch. They receive information from the individual county court systems. They receive independent information from arresting agencies and state police. 
they receive independently reported information from Department of Corrections. And in many cases, they attempt to reconcile those, but um, as, so it's more of a rap sheet, uh, originally designed more for law enforcement purposes to determine, you know, a, a, you know, a suspect's probability to maybe commit a crime, things like that. Um, but they, these have been repurposed into uh, the consumer reporting world that uh, you partake in now as, uh, as an end user of, of background checks. Um, so they, it's a fairly large, uh, it's a larger net. Um, it covers you know, obviously where available state uh, from, from border to border within that state. It does have slightly larger holes in that net. So um, from, you know, from a fishing analogy, uh, a county search is throwing a very uh, fine net into a very small pool, uh, but you're, mo you're very likely to, if something exists in that pool, you're going to pull that out. For the state repositories, it's a larger net, but it's also got larger holes. Um, and it's also, there are areas that um, can compromise the integrity of the information in those databases in as much as not all counties report information uniformly to the state repository. Um, in some states, the county, not every county even has the technology to report information into their state repository. So the state police may arrest somebody, report the arrest, but then the case takes place in a very rural county that doesn't have um, uh, electronic records and the clerk of courts is also the sheriff and the sheriff also fishes on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And um, so that information doesn't routinely get reported. So you kind of have a gap in the history. You have a pointer, you know, arrest took place, but you don't know what the end result was. There is a subversion of state repositories in what they call office of court administrations, which are, um, they don't exist in, in every state from a public access standpoint, but um, where they exist, they are a centralized access terminal or database uh, that the individual county courts feed their information to or partake in. Um, it's independent of the state repository. Even where there's an OCA, there's still typically a state repository because the state repository is also oftentimes where fingerprints are processed through. So um, the pros and cons of, the, of source three here, the state repositories, it is um, while FCRA compliant, it is not a direct source as far as origination. Um, so it's, a, it's an official government source. Um, it, it meets FCRA criteria for reportability, but the information, they don't really manufacture the information. They're just receiving input information from other, um, other parties, other counties, other court systems, other uh, law enforcement agencies. And uh, they are often searchable by SSN. They provide a uh, fairly large coverage and um, a streamlined summary of uh, the an individual's history along with AKAs, things like that. So it provides a rap sheet in essence. Um, many of them do have fairly quick turnaround times, at least for, for uh, clears um, and are electronic in their submission. Um, but at the same time, jumping over the cons, not every state makes their uh, state repository publicly accessible. So. Um, that is a state-by-state -state preference. There's no constitutional requirement that a state repository be available. Um, and uh, some of them also have fingerprint requirements. So the only way to submit to them is through a fingerprint and perhaps even through a specific state law that will only permit submission to a fingerprint other, under a, a, some type of regulatory requirement. Um, the information is not quite as thorough or reliable as uh, the county. Generally, uh, many CRA, many background screening companies will validate information that comes from the state repository by doing an independent county search of that same case just to make sure. Um, but there is risk of, uh, um, uh, of false negatives, incomplete information, and also uh, when reporting out potential records and some of them, it could take a very long time. And in the hiring and contracting context, uh, waiting three to six weeks for a result is not always uh, an option. And um, on a side note, they also tend to come with a separate and sometimes notable fee uh, in addition to just the, uh, the act of physically going, you know, processing the request. The fourth source that I'm going to mention here, and I, I'm not gonna spend a tremendous amount of time on it, but I do wanna mention it. It's because uh, there, sometimes this information bleeds with another, uh, another consumer reporting product, but the FBI database, the FBI database is um, a, a federal repository, much like the state repositories we just discussed, just on the federal level. 
So the information that's being fed into them is being fed from the state repositories. It's being fed from law enforcement. Um, it's uh, being it, it's coming through various different channels. Um, and so any gap or issue in the state repository system is going to be compounded by the fact that that is then being passed on to the FBI database. Um, the FBI database is tremendously valuable and, and, and highly functional in a whole lot of different contexts. But again, it was initially designed as a law enforcement tool and it has been repurposed for screening and uh, particularly in regulated environments. So, you know, anyone on the call that represents a, a state department insurance or a state agency may be familiar with the fingerprinting process and submitting uh, for an individual to, um, you know, receive a certain level of clearance and they get an FBI result back, things like that. But as a general rule, this database is not a product that is available in uh, standard background screening for uh, agents, producers, um, at, in relation to their relationship with the carrier that they're going to be producing for. So a quick snapshot on that, a pros and cons, again, it's a biometric search, which is, um, you know, uh, decreases the likelihood of a false, uh, a, a false positive, um, very broad coverage and a universal response format. So that's also helpful um, because they are kind of repurposing the information that's fed to them. But on the cons, and these are some pretty big cons, uh, it's very limited, only uh, only available for certain regulatory purposes to uh, parties and, and entities that have been predefined as uh, can, can have access. It does also come with fees. The results um, cannot be stored outside of the FBI. So uh, if your background screening company, um, you know, if for some reason were to receive an FBI rap sheet, um, it is actually illegal for a consumer reporting agency or any private company to store an FBI uh, uh, database uh, hit and its results in any type of table or anywhere else outside of the FBI system. Um, it's not incredibly likely that uh, someone will come knocking at the door, but it is illegal and ultimately they could knock at the door and, and seize the systems and servers at that time. And also uh, just like the, the, uh, the uh, state databases or the state repository it can be incomplete and have unlinked information that could to a uh, non-experienced uh, reader of those reports indicate someone or it would read as if someone has more events than they actually do in their history. So um, having explained the FBI database, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the multi-jurisdictional database. And this is for anyone that's using a background screening company, you've probably heard of a national crim search uh, um, and whether or not that's in your background screening program or not. This is has nothing to do with the FBI database. This is a national uh, criminal database is in essence a multi-jurisdictional database. Uh, it is not a government sanctioned list. It is not maintained by the FBI or the state or local government. Uh, what it does is these are proprietary databases that have over time aggregated, purchased, combined, uh, merged information to create a, uh, a very effective research tool in the background screening process that can identify potential criminal history for certain candidates. It has, uh, it has gaps, it, it has benefits. Uh, again, there's no, there's no single source that's gonna fix everything here, but um, the, the frequency of the information that's reported to these databases uh, can, can vary by jurisdiction. It can be varied within a state. Some jurisdictions are woefully underrepresented in these databases, and it, it ties directly to whether or not that same court system maintains digital records and has ever, ever made them available for bulk purchase or, or uh, under any context. A perfect example of that would be the Louisiana Parish system. Very rarely will you get any information uh, out of a Louisiana Parish, any criminal history out of Louisiana Parish that um, in, within a, a query of a national crim database. However, you would get the sex offender registration information, you would get arresting information, things like that, but the actual court data is uh, uh, has just never really been digitally available. So um, it's a very, very effective tool. Um, I recommend it in any background screening program. We use it on our, our, our own employees at, at my organization. And um, it is a, a very, very common tool in just about any 
background screening program that I've been a part of. But again, snapshotting the pros and cons of this, uh, the national national CRIM for, uh, I'll just call it the NAT CRIM for now. It is searchable through a combination of identifiers. It has very large coverage, but so it's a very, very large net. And in some areas, the net's very fine. In other areas, the net has uh, very uh, sizable holes in it. Um, it has a universal response format, making it somewhat easy to interpret. You don't have to deal with uh, cross-jurisdictional um, uh, issues. It may have additional information on probation and parole, Department of Corrections records or uh, arresting uh, information. Um, it's often merged with also include sex offender registries and uh, your OF, uh, you know, Office of Foreign Asset Control watch list searches, specially designated national SAM reports. All those types of things are, are typically merged into this. So, and uh, it's for a CRA, a background screening company, it, uh, it's an immediate response. Uh, that being said, uh, I would not recommend any background screening program where these results are released directly to an end user. Um, I. I believe the best practices, and it's it's. I think it's widely agreed that the best practice is to research the results, and then um, if it indicates a, a criminal history for uh, for Greg Kirsch in uh, in Tampa, Florida, then you would run uh, in a county search uh, in that specific county to try to get the up to date information for that item. So as such, it's generally not um, reporting the results as is with no other steps and no other types of consumer notices is uh, not FCRA compliant, hits require validation, there can be false negatives, false positives, and it has its uneven coverage. So I just kind of plugged through these five sources, uh, one, one slide each describing them and one slide each uh, providing the pros and cons, which leads us back to this grid that I started with. Um, you have the county, state repository, federal district. Uh, and I'm just assuming you can see my mouse, but you probably can't. So let me see if I can do this. Uh, uh, there we go. County courts, state repository, federal district, national crime database, and then the FBI database. Here's its accuracy and compliance rating. And, um, uh, and again, these are, uh, th this stuff ultimately would be my opinion. Um, I, I, I having done this for many, many years and worked with a lot of individuals in compliance capacities, I'm confident in this information, but I think this is not legal advice uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but you can see on the county courts and the federal courts, we, we say that it reports the historical case data, and we, can, we say that it's direct source and also standalone FCRA compliant because it's a state agency or it's a government agency. Uh, same with the state repository, but the state repository has broader geographic coverage. The NACRIM has broad ge geographic coverage, but that's it as far as its accuracy and compliance. And the FBI database, I put it here, but it's not really uh, it's not really even an option for the vast majority of any audience that, that attends this, this type of content. The search criteria just identifies what we can search by. Uh, again, it does not apply to all jurisdictions, so state repositories some have name and, and SSN, some permit fingerprint, but also do a, a varying name-based search. Some don't have any search at all. So, uh, you know, we have to put a, some, some asterisks here. But, and then as far as the parties it's available to, that's the breakdown of this grid. Uh, if you were going to take anything away from, from the content we reviewed so far to, to just have a, an elevator speech on this, this is the breakdown of the five primary sources for criminal history in a consumer reporting context. Now, I wanna move here to how do you take this information and turn it into a program? Because we have these searches, but how do we know where to search? Are we searching, um, are we going to uh, just rely on the information a candidate provides as far as their address history? Um, your, certainly not going to put together a background screening program that says i want to every time i run a background i run a, a candidate i want to run every single individual federal district search i want to run all three thousand counties and their county equivalents um, i want to run the 37 of the 50 state repositories that are available to me the the price would be astronomical there and the number of uh of negative events negative being uh, no no hit no result events would be um, it's just not cost or time effective in any onboarding environment. So um, a very common tool, and 
you know, within my organization, we call it an address insight. There's address traces. There's various different versions of th this product. But in essence, you want to kind of run an address history, some type of address history product that's going to uh, identify the name or names that are commonly associated with the individual. Um, it can ident identify date of birth and SSN variations. And it's also going to uh, list in some type of sequential format their address history. Um, to, and it, that address history could be um, just the most recent three addresses. It could be every address that they've um, ever uh, you know, resided in or had a pizza delivered to or delivered something to an Amazon. There's various levels within these products of, of um, how they can react to this. But if you're talking about what is a best history or best practices package to run, it's going to start with an address trace of some sort that's going to identify the, the information. It's also going to take into account any information the candidate provided uh, throughout the initial screening process. And then you're going to run a national criminal, uh, the NACRIM database. And then from there, you have that whole list of where they've known associated residences and the national CRIM possible results. And from there, you start adding those individual county and federal district searches, or if the county's not available, you could add a, a statewide, which brings us basically to this. This is the best practices criminal history package, in my professional opinion. And um, uh, this, and I'd say this also as uh, an individual, you know, we have our, you know, my organization has our own employees that have access to uh, confidential and proprietary information, and this is the exact same uh, approach we take to our own uh, employees. So it's not, a, it's not a sales pitch. This is a, if you want to have the uh, best possible outcome of identifying criminal history on an individual, um, some version of this packaging is what you're going to want to have when you're running a, a background screening candidate. You're going to want to run their address trace, run the national cram, identify possible hits, develop the counties and the federal districts of their associated residence history or where they worked and went to school, some other factors there, and run the, the different name variations in that. And if your onboarding process and budget permitted, you could always run ad state repositories too, but generally speaking, this is what you want to do. The price points vary, the volumes vary. Um, some I've seen some companies say, I, I will run up to three names or up to three uh, address histories, or I, I want basic what we call an all you can eat type uh, scenario where um, every time we submit a candidate, we're going to run this, no matter what's to, what's identified, it's going to be added to the, to the screening, we're going to process it, and it's going to be for a fixed uh, amount, plus any pass through fees. So there's a lot of varying business practices in here. This is also an area that is uh, very often not clearly defined within an RFP process. So if you're ever looking for a background screening provider, it's very important um, just how you use a certain word, whether you're talking about doing a seven-year search versus uh, searches in jurisdictions for seven years of address history. Those are two very different things. The seven-year search is only searching that court for records that are seven years old. Meanwhile, identifying address history for seven years and then doing all the court systems for whatever is reportable under the FCRA is a very, is a much larger, broader scope. Um, so I have an example here. Uh, this is not a real person. Nothing about this is real, but um, just for the purpose of de demonstrating some of the different types of packaging options that exist in the, in the marketplace for background checks, you have, uh, let's just say this is our known candidate information. The applicant provided us this information, date of birth, name, SSN, and their, uh, their current residence. And, um, you know, in hindsight, we know that these are the name variations that this individual has used through uh, for any number of reasons. And uh, these are, this is the address history that this individual has had. Um, and with the benefit of hindsight, we know at this time that this is the person's actual kind of criminal history uh, information. In Pasco, in Florida, uh, there, there's been no offense history. And in Pennsylvania, we do have some offense history under some name variations or in, in some districts that are outside of the uh, current residence. We also have some information that came out of Delaware, and we have some information that came out of New Jersey. So if we were to take this and apply a very limited scope 
uh, package to this. So a package where we're taking the information that the individual provided, we're only running the current county and the current federal district uh, based off of the provided information, this is what we will get. This person will be clear. The process isn't broken. The background screening company did not miss anything. The scope of the package that was requested, which was probably a bargain basement type you know, package, um, will search exactly this. It will have done exactly what the scope of work said it was going to do. And it's going to tell you that this individual has no history. Um, if you just take that up one, uh, one additional layer, where instead you go with a county and federal develop. So we're now gonna at least develop, we're only gonna run the current name, but we're going to develop the address history and run those based off of this. So it's a slightly uh, larger scope package. Now we're starting to get a little bit more of the information. It's still identified Florida is clear. It's gonna tell us we're gonna have some information here in Pennsylvania, but we're still gonna miss this item in Chester County, Pennsylvania, because that's not part of the address history but the national crime hasn't been added to this package yet. We're not going to get anything here in, uh, in, in, um, in Delaware or in, in New Jersey. So we're getting a very limited scope response on this. Now, if we take it up one more layer and we add the county and federal develop from address insight, and we're also adding the AKAs, the name variants that all came through here. Now we're even getting more and more information. And the only item that we haven't identified in this scope is this uh, this bad checks event. And then finally, what I would consider the best practices package includes all of these things and it's running that AKA and we're, we've got that information. So now we've got a pretty complete history on a candidate. And, and you may think, is it really that common for people to move around that much? I would say it, it's more and more common and it's, it's only expanding more with uh, virtual workplaces and um, and, and within the millennial population now, um, people are moving around a lot. They don't have roots. They don't set up roots. They move for jobs. They move for friends. Their lives are online and virtual so they can live and uh, exist just about anywhere and, and continue to thrive. So um, these scenarios are things that uh, um, are these, these approaches, these best practices approaches to identify um, residence history and uh, and and basically where do people spend their time because I, I don't think you need a study to tell you but um, crimes are most awfully often committed in areas where people live work went to school which is where they spend their time um, sometimes it's a cross-border event and things like that you you have those scenarios where someone that may have spent their entire life in Pennsylvania but goes down to um, you know, the, I, I don't know, the Jersey or, or New York uh, beaches or something um, every so often, but doesn't have any residence history there. That's what that national crime is, is set to identify. You're not just developing based off of their known residence history, You're using that national crime to also pull that one item out that you wouldn't know. And it may seem like uh, uh, overkill, you know, to kind of a, take this approach, but it's a pretty common practice now. And if you're not taking this approach, eventually you will have a conversation about a missed record. And the missed record won't be because the program itself failed or the scope of work wasn't performed. It would be because the package and the way that the contracted approach to running a back background check was, um, it may become a surprise to you that it wasn't doing that, but it in fact wasn't doing that. And inevitably it will come up. And if you run 500 candidates a year, um, you, it may happen once every three years, but it, it will happen I inevitably it will. So, um, I talked a little bit about scope as far as the seven year searches, if it's a seven years from, uh, you know, do I want to develop seven years of address history? Why would I only want to report seven years of information? There's a, I could do an entire slide deck on, on this and the FCRA and the EOC alone, but generally speaking, uh, seven years is a time tested uh, marker. Um, if you're familiar with credit reports, uh, information falls off your credit, adverse information falls off your credit report after seven years. There's a, just an indicator that seven years is the uh, marker for when um, an, an, an item of information could have relevancy to today. Um, but it is very important to make sure you define, um, do, do I want searches done for seven years or do I want to search, do I want to collect seven years of address history 
and you know, address jurisdictional history and then run those county searches to the fullest scope that my program can run. And then I, whatever information I receive, do I want, how do I want to consume it? And when it, whenever you're talking about criminal history information, it's very important that you take into account the EOC's 2012 guidance on uh, the use of criminal history information. You want to make sure it's relevant to the position um, uh, and, and that, uh, uh, you know, if there's a like, likelihood that it would affect the position. They have several different, uh, there's a seven or eight point checklist of items that needs to take place. And it's also very common within the individual state fair chance and ban the box laws. So I don't want to go too far into it because that's a, a conversation unto itself. Um, so, uh, and the only thing else, the only thing I, that I would also want to mention too is uh, I, when I discussed the national crim, uh, the, the NAT crim, um, that's also the same product that's used in some of the criminal history monitoring programs. That's something that's become a lot more um, it's becoming a lot more common now and over the last uh, five to 10 years. Um, in essence, what it is, is you're taking an active roster inventory and you're running them against you know, the, the national crime either continuously or, um, or it's a new ping once a month and it's going to report any new information that comes back to you. Uh, that can be very valuable. Um, I, I was doing an internal case study on a, on a client segment of about uh, they had, they had screened about 650 to 700 individuals in the last 365 days and in turn wanted to just identify how many of them had events that had come up since their initial screening took place. And sure enough, there was four. I mean, they were all misdemeanors. One was assault, one was DUI and two others, but four out of, you know, 650, you're, you know, you're, you're talking less than 1%, but 1% of just the population that you've screened in the last year of, of, of new hire screenings um, had an event that occurred after the initial screening, after they were onboarded. It's up to you whether or not that, that has an impact. But when you start talking about, well, how, many, how much history takes place in, in jurisdictions outside of where they've lived or, or worked, um, you know, most companies, you know, run about a, a, a five to 7% hit rate on criminal history on a per candidate basis, uh, de depending on uh, industry and vertical. But um, I've seen as much as a half of that stuff take place in non-resident counties um, in a similar uh, sizing. And it's not published, but I just shared with the membership on a similar sizing, 2.3% of all the results that we had in that same size that were, took place in non-residential jurisdictions. And um, you know, not much, less than one percent, but less than about one percent of the uh, records were um, filed under an AKA, which could be a maiden, a maiden name, or any other thing. So, um, you know, just to put it into, into perspective, when you're talking about a game of, uh, well, not a game, but when you're talking about a a, um, a, a a program that's built around exceptions, and you're really trying to identify just the two or three people that are trying to manipulate the system and gain a benefit that they're otherwise uh, uh, may may not be eligible for. These exceptions very much matter. So um, that's it. I will open it up for questions um, from the. Uh, silo team. I hope uh, there's been some. I can turn. Yeah, off. we have. We definitely have one for sure, and then I might have something for you. But um, we have a, a comment, and I'm not sure you can see them, Greg. So I'm going to go ahead and read it. If we are using, um, you know, TransUnion TLO type background program to gather our data on new hires, are we getting all the data on that person? I'd hate to think we're doing due diligence and not getting all the information we're looking for. So do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, if I if I understand the question correctly, you're, you're, um, that ties into the address history and address trace um, kind of a content and, and slide um, uh, TLO. That's uh, definitely a call out. I haven't heard that in a, in a year or so. Um, uh, just TLO goes, goes way back. They were one of the original sources for that type of uh, information. But yes, the um, uh, if you're using exclusively a credit header, then you're probably only getting the last three address history events. If you are using, you know, some of the, the broader programs, the TLOs and, and, and different kind of much longer address histories, then uh, then you're you're getting more more search points. So generally speaking, I uh, I recommend some type of a um, 
uh, an address history. I'm not a, a huge fan of the credit bureau only address history because again, it only shows the last three. You, you want the expanded one, the one that shows information from multiple credit bureaus uh, and that lends itself more to the TLO site. Very good. And then we have a question about what shows up on a background check if a felony has been pardoned, if there's a disposition. Okay, so um, a pardoned, now almost anything I say here is going to be wrong because there's going to be some example that will, uh, that will run uh, against the grain here. But an expungement for all intents and purposes should not exist. A pardon may very well exist but um, the, the, uh, and, and be a reportable event, but at the same time as that end user, um, you might want to almost look at if that pardon makes its way onto that consumer report, um, you would want to look at that very similar to how you might look at a 1033 waiver. Um, but you know, if you get a report that, you know, so there's various different, there's so many different types of jurisdictions. There can be deferred adjudication, adjudication withheld, First offender program, ARD, um, that, you know, that's accelerated rehabilitative disposition. All these programs can, depending on states and how they're classified, they can come with different dispositions. Some are considered convictions, some are considered non convictions. Under, there's a case, a recent case on the uh, federal level that has stated that the act of providing a plea of guilt meets the conviction threshold under federal law. But at the same time, it's the only case of its kind so far. So it's a, it's a risky argument to put all those things on. So um, it, you really need to dissect each aspect of that, but, and also take into account, think EOC guidance, if somebody pardoned somebody, um, and if it made it onto that report, the act of a pardoned event is not in and of itself a non-reportable event. Um, there's arguments for not reporting it, but uh, th th there's nothing black and white on it. Interesting. So I hope I didn't talk in circles too much there, but it's a, it's a can dispositions and their application, a deferred adjudication that with two years probation, but it doesn't ever actually officially show as dismissed. Meanwhile, in another state, they have to petition to have it dismissed. They could petition to have it dismissed and expunged. They could petition to have it dismissed. That could take place, but then the expungement is still pending. So what do you do with expungement pending? Is that reportable? There's there's so many variables in there and that's where really the expertise of, um, they really have to be looked at on a case by case basis. And that's where, you know, when we have those events, those are one of the few times that I get really involved in specific candidate level things. Cause there's a lot of risk that goes on there. You don't want to, you don't want to be responsible for eliminating somebody or playing a role in eliminating somebody from a, a, a position that they are uh, otherwise and by all means qualified for. So, but you also want to make sure the end user has the information that they need to make a decision based off of uh, intelligent information. So when we were getting ready for this conversation, Greg, you mentioned a couple of hot topics. You, you did run through the criminal history monitoring idea. I mean, yeah. that, this is kind of new for, for me anyway, because that's, this isn't a part of a licensing sandbox I play in, but the, um, you, you also mentioned the, the fact that the date of birth is being removed from court records. You want to tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so um, there's, a, there's a thing that's going on right now with, um, again, I mentioned that county court records are, are publicly available. County court records also include date of birth on them in almost all cases. So, uh, and under most interpretations of PII, a person identifiable information and protections that would go along with it, a name and date of birth combination is considered a PII combination. So some states just recently have tried to enact laws that either suppress the DOB from the case index or uh, Michigan went through a process recently. And um, there's, some, there's some really good, really hardworking folks at the Professional Background Screening Association that have um, you know, the minute this type of legislation comes up, they are all over it and they're uh, doing grassroots lobbying to try to modify it because these laws are written without understanding the, uh, you know, the ripple effect that it has on various industries, consumer reporting being one of them, because background check companies have a responsibility to, and, you know, when reporting information, it's the 613 clause of the FCRA. If you were reporting adverse information that is the public records, um, that are likely to have an adverse impact on a, on a consumer, 
we have to maintain strict procedures to ensure the information uh, is uh, up to date and from the best possible source and reasonable procedures to ensure maximum possible accuracy. That stands for anything. So um, we have to, without the date of birth, it makes validating a common name or different name variables, um, it, it makes the burden much higher. And at the, at the end of the day, if we can't match something to an individual, we can't report it. If we can't affirmatively say that it is that individual, we can't report it. Um, so it's something that's been going on in Michigan. I think actually right now, uh, everything was looking really good and, and PBSA really pushed a bunch of stuff through and, 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 and helped kind of at least stem this thing in Michigan until, uh, uh the, the Michigan's going to revisit it in, uh, to, in January. But, um, I think there's eight counties right now that just went down because, they are not releasing information and they don't have the internal clerical uh, assistance to help validate date of birth or something. So um, we're, as of two days ago, still navigating that. And there are also a couple of counties in California that have been trying to approach this subject. So um, it's, it's getting a little messy out there. Um, the argument is like a state repository is a, is a better search for that, but I, I Clearly, I outlined the holes in the state repository. Um, uh, so, I, and, and if the county is completely unavailable, then yeah, the state repository is the best possible source for information that may occur in that county at this time. But um, at the, at the end of the day, that that county court system is really what you need. And we can't really rely on can, um, consumers. You know, the three to five percent of all consumers that have notable, impactful criminal history. Um, that warrants at least further evaluation and review. We can't really rely on them to provide us the case number of all their offenses at the time of application. So, um, yeah, so I don't have a finite, uh, it's more of a news update and a to be continued, but that's something that's, that's pretty new. The federal court system has been like that forever. So we're just used to that. But the hit rate in the federal court system is so much lower that the impact is not the same. I mean, county courts, if anybody's ever had anything happen to them or knows anybody that's had uh, criminal history events in their, in their lives, chances are it took place in the county court system. Interesting. So we did have a, a question, Greg, about um, whether the slide deck could be made available, um, if you'd be fine with that. So we'll um, be able to yeah. send that out to anyone who's interested. Yeah, and then I think I think we can make that available. I mean, some of the information, um, I've presented the same content um, in a lot of different uh, forums. I mean, some of this has been fine tuned because Sila have worked with so closely you know, over the years, but um, yeah, I have no problem doing that. I just- But it's some of it's opinion, so- um, Yeah, oh, a lot of it, a lot, the whole, the whole thing, the whole thing, you know, everything that I just went through is not the opinion of Sila. Um, it is not legal advice. It has uh, no reflection on the side of the foundation, side of the best practices handbook. It doesn't even tie into my role as the background checks, uh, background investigation task group chair. I mean, this is, um, this is my professional opinion backed by my own actions over 15 years of what I think that the best practices approach Very is. Cool. That's what, exactly what we wanted you to uh, provide us with today. Um, and then I think the last thing you were going to do was give us a little commercial or, for, about the survey you have coming out. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, so the background investigations task group is uh, working to finalize, I think it's our fourth um, uh, you know, industry practices survey in, the, in five years now. Um, and we're hoping to send that out. We'd like to get that in publication over the next couple of months. I'm saying out to the membership to actually take the survey. Uh, many of the folks on this call may have, uh, you know, participated in that survey in the past. It's provided really great insight. We uh, usually make another webinar session out of it or something that we can go through and talk about what different carriers are doing. Um, again, for, uh, for uh, the, the DOI folks and some of the other parties out there, uh, you know, it, it doesn't directly pertain to you, but uh, it, I think it's still very valuable to know how carriers are treating this and where, when they are running backgrounds, what are they running and how are they running it. So um, just please be on the lookout for it. The group works really hard on trying to um, identify what questions should continue so that we can do trend tracking, what ones have like, for instance, we asked the question over the years, do you use a background screening company or run your own backgrounds? 
Um, we're at, a, I think, 99.2%. Uh, we use a background screening company response on that. So I think we're going to pull that question. I don't think it's necessary to keep driving that one home. But um, so uh, pretty excited about that um, for, for the group. And um, I'd love to make that, you know, if we can get that out and get the results back in and get the response threshold where we want it to be when it actually uh, goes out make that maybe a end of the year deliverable in, in the form of webinar educational content. Honestly, I think one of the best things Silo does is original research. So I would encourage everyone to participate. If you're a Silo member and you get that survey, please do fill it out because that, that helps us. Mm -hmm. um, and it you know, helps us ha collect data that's really very specific to uh, what we do. Um, within our industry. So, um, and I think it would be okay, Greg, if people had individual questions, there's a couple questions for recommendations. I don't think you probably want to publicly make, but if there are people who want to contact you, um, that that would be fine. I'm assuming. Yeah, of course. Of course. I mean, I'd, I'll be at Sila. I'll be in Philadelphia um, uh, for anyone that is going. Um, I think most have my email address through the uh, the committee and or the task group and some of the other um uh you know roles that i've played over the years um i even have my little my silent president's award right back here behind me it's, it's in the show. So, uh, um yeah if you uh if anybody has any questions i'm always happy to consult on this stuff um you know again i look at an exposure event to any company in sila is a potential exposure event to the, the industry in general and i think that there's been a lot of really good effort that's been put forth to get to improve the memberships uh risk avoidance practices both in background screening and also in in the, around the fcra compliance and stuff over the last several years and um i i definitely don't want to uh, so i think i think it's time to play us off the stage we took up the whole hour so that's a that's a new one for us we usually wrap up kind of early everybody was engaged and interested we did have one more comment about you know, most agents we hire don't have their court docs right on hand so that visiting the criminal databases helps them retrieve their docs and helps a lot with the, getting the whole process of contracting and licensing going. Um, so I will wrap us up with that last comment. Um, thank you, Greg, for spending time with us today on, on this compliance topic. And obviously it's critically important to all of us involved in licensing and onboarding. The webinar has been recorded and it will be available via a link on the Sila Foundation website very soon. So you can share it with members of your team who might also be interested. All of you will be receiving a post webinar survey be sure to fill that out and provide us with candid feedback. That'll help us improve these programs going forward. Sila Foundation provides these webinars free of charge as part of our mission and outreach. If you learned something of value today, please consider a personal or corporate donation to the foundation. No amount is too small. We rely on donations and sponsorships to keep programs like these going. And if your company might be interested in sponsoring a future webinar, let me or Mary Ellen Hammock know. Speaking of future webinars, next month, August 19th, we'll be hearing from Megan Walker from Blue Skies Meteorological Services about forensic meteorology. It's a thing and how it is applied to insurance coverages and claims. Watch for the official invite and uh, registration details coming soon. And thanks so much for joining us. Please enjoy the rest of your day.